Praise God, praise God, praise God. Amen. Good to be with people of light, precious faith. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, the older I get, the older I get, the more I'm convinced not only that there is a God, but the God of the Bible is the only God. Jesus said he was the way, the truth, and the life. You see, it's not enough to just have some vague belief that there's a superior being somewhere. You need to know who he is. You need to believe in him. You need to put your faith in him. And then you need to obey him. Amen. It's really quite a simple formula, isn't it? Believe, have faith, and obey. Praise God. Well, we want to go in our text this morning. Uh, Matthew chapter 21. This is Palm Sunday. And I see that we have palms here up at the front. I don't know if that was intentional or just a change of decoration. Or maybe it's been there for this whole time and I've just noticed it now. That is quite possible. Matthew chapter 21, we're going to read the account of Jesus' triumphal entry. Now when they, uh, start in verse 1, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethage and the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them. And immediately he will send them. And all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt, and they laid their clothes on them, and he sat on them. And a very great multitude, a very great multitude, spread their garments on the road, and others cut down tree, branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Verse 9, then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. And today we're going to preach a message entitled Hosanna. Hosanna. Brother, uh, Brother Russell, would you ask God's blessing on our word today? Father, thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, that you came and gave your life for us, oh God, in this time of season. Oh God, we ask to bless Pastor Bob right now. Bless our ears, bless our hearts. Help us be open unto your word today. In Jesus' name, we ask you. Amen. As you're being seated, everybody shout, Hosanna! Hosanna. Hosanna. Praise God. Most of Christianity recognizes Palm Sunday as the start of what is known as Holy Week or Passion Week. It's the remembrance of the, it is the remembrance of Jesus' final seven days of his earthly ministry. I can remember being a young boy, I was raised in the Catholic Church and Easter time was a special time. And just being a young boy, I can remember uh, going through what was called the Stations of the Cross. I don't know if anyone, being a Catholic, has remembered the Stations of the Cross. And what it was, was they had different plaques along the wall of the church, and each plaque represented a different depiction of the Passion story. One, story, one picture was maybe of Jesus in front of Pilate, and then another one was a, a picture of him being whipped and scourged, and another one was a picture of Simon of Cyrene helping him carry the cross, and the priest would lead us in a devotion in front of each station. He would say a prayer and uh, he would uh, talk about the scene that was depicted on there. And really it was a time of reflection. It was supposed to be a time of 
uh, understanding of what Jesus went through for my sins and for your sins. It was a time really to get a little bit more serious about the things that really matter in life. You see, our world is so full of foolishness today. Foolishness compounded upon foolishness, sin upon sin, that I think it would be Ta a good time, even starting today, this week, about thinking about the serious issues of life. You know, our pursuit of happiness and our, our, our pursuit of constantly trying to feel good sometimes blurs out the, necess the necessity of reflecting about what really matters in life. And little did I know at the time as a young boy what was being instilled in my heart that that would one day later come to serve me very well. Because I, as a young child, I didn't understand the full depth and the full impact of it. And that's to be expected. The Bible says foolishness is bound up in the heart of what? Children. And trust me, I was full of foolishness. So it's the remembrance Palm Sunday, it's the start of the remembrance of Jesus' final seven days of earthly ministry. One writer said that Holy Week was the beginning of the end for Jesus' work on earth. And Palm Sunday is the day we celebrate his triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem one week before his resurrection. You see, the Jewish people at this time, they were awaiting the coming of a savior, a king who would rescue them from Roman control. They had been waiting for centuries for the coming of the Messiah, for the king that was prophesied about, for generations it was talked about, will this be the year that the king comes? Will this be the year that uh, the Messiah comes to save us from the uh, control of those nations around us? My dad talked about him. My grandpa talked about him. My, my great-grandpa talked about him. I wonder if this is the year that the Messiah would come. You see, the crowds on that day of Palm Sunday, they looked for a Messiah who would rescue them politically and free them nationally. But Jesus came to free them spiritually. And for many centuries, they, want, they were under control of different empires, from the Assyrians to the Babylonians to the Persians to the Greeks, and finally, the Roman Empire. They longed, they longed for freedom. Was Jesus the Savior that the Scriptures talked about? Was Jesus the King that the Scriptures foretold about? Yes, he was. You see, the prophecy in the Old Testament described the coming Messiah as a reigning king. And it also described the coming Messiah as a suffering servant. And this led to confusion among many people. And this led some to speculate, well, maybe, maybe there's going to be two messiahs. For how can a conquering king also be a suffering servant? And God spoke, and so there was this confusion among certain people. Maybe there's two messiahs. God spoke to King David, and he said to David that your offspring or your descendant would sit upon the throne of an everlasting kingdom. Second Samuel chapter 7, this is God speaking to King David. He said, when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And so God is letting David know, and he's letting us know that from your descendants, David, there will come a king, and he will establish a kingdom that will last forever. You see, David, King David, he was a conqueror. He was a warrior. He was one who was victorious in many battles. He really was a far cry from a suffering servant that the other scriptures prophesied the Messiah would be. The Messiah's suffering was prophesied about in the Old Testament and the most recognized is the one that we find in Isaiah. The prophet Isaiah says in chapter 53... 
Starting in verse 1, it says, Who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weakness that he carried. It was our sorrow that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God and a punishment for his own sin. But he was pierced for our rebellion. He was crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. And he was whipped so we could be healed. And all of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sin of us, all of us, on him. So which one was it? Was the Messiah a king, or was he a suffering servant? Or was he both? Well, the answer is he was both. For only in Jesus Christ the prophecies of the Old Testament are fulfilled. You can look at every other figure in history that has claimed to be a Messiah and they do not fulfill the prophecies of the word of God. So he is both a conquering king and he is both the suffering Messiah. The day we recognize as Palm Sunday was actually foretold 500 years before Jesus' arrival in Jerusalem that day. The prophet Zechariah, 500 years earlier, spoke of the coming king. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 says, Rejoice, O people of Zion! Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem! For look! Your king is coming to you, and he is righteous and victorious, and yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. The fact that God chose a donkey for Israel's king to enter Jerusalem was very significant. Many missed it. Many miss it today. You know what? Even his disciples missed it at the time it was happening. You know, have you ever been in a situation where you've been so close to something, you can't recognize the most obvious thing that's staring you in the face? That's how it was for the disciples, and I believe many in those days. In John chapter 12, starting in verse 14, Then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, Fear not, O daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming sitting on a colt. Verse 16, his disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written about him, that uh, that they had done these things to him. You know, and as a young boy standing in front of those stations of the cross with uh, the priest, the man of God, trying and still in me those truths, I didn't understand it at first. You know, it was a story, but I didn't understand the depth and the impact that it really was going to have in my life in the not-too-distant future. And that's how it is sometimes. We hear the things of God. We, sometimes it doesn't just it make sense always at that time. But I want you to know, stick with it. Stay with it. One day the spiritual light bulbs are going to go on. And just like these disciples, you go, oh, now I know what the preacher was saying. Oh, now I know what the scripture was saying. Oh, now I understand. You see, in our modern Western way of thinking, we think of kings entering in on a majestic horse, a very noble steed all decked out in gear, and they come prancing in on that noble steed. Donkeys were just merely a beast of burden. Let's face it, we kind of all view donkeys as being kind of dumb, don't we? (laughs) Right? We want, to make some, we want to make fun of somebody, we call them a donkey, but we use the slang term, right? 
We view donkeys as kind of dumb, something to be joked about. However, it wasn't that way in the, in the ancient East. God was intentional about what he does. He's always intentional about what he does, and he never missed an opportunity to use powerful symbols throughout Scripture. And Jesus' famous ride on this lowly animal reveals much about Christ's character and his purpose. In the ancient Middle Eastern world, leaders, leaders and kings, they rode horses when they rode into war. But donkeys, if they came in peace. First Kings chapter 1 mentions Solomon riding a donkey on the day he was recognized as the new king of Israel. His father was King David, and he was about to transfer the power of the kingdom to his son, King Solomon. And First Kings chapter 1 Verse 33 says, The king said to them, Take Solomon and my officials down to the Gihon Spring, and Solomon is to ride on my own mule, showing a peaceful transfer of kingly power. The donkey is commonly associated with the pursuits of peace. When the judges ruled over Israel, it was a time when they were at peace. You remember as you read the nation of Israel, they would get in trouble, they would forsake God. And I want you to know that's a good lesson for us, that when we forsake God in our life, you can be sure trouble will come. But God would raise up a judge that would judge them and rule over them, and it became a time of peace where people's hearts turned back again to God. And they rode donkeys. The leaders rode donkeys. Judges chapter 10, verses 3 and 4 says this, After Tola died, J.R. the Gilead from Gilead judged Israel for 22 years, and his 30 sons rode around on 30 donkeys, and they owned 30 towns in the land of Gilead, which are still called the towns of J.R., you see, the symbolic character of the donkey as an animal used for, people pers purpose, for peaceful purposes stand in marked contrast to a horse whose imagery associates it with war. You see, a man riding on a donkey, he's not looking for war. And in Jesus' case, he came to save, perhaps, carried by the lowliest animals of all. And as he rode in Jerusalem, the people responded by laying down palm branches and by laying down their garments. And both of those came with symbolic significance. The palm branch is a symbol of victory, triumph, peace, and eternal life, originating in the ancient Near East and in the Mediterranean world. And even God in the law, when he commanded the Israelite nation to celebrate certain feasts, on the, when they were to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, they were, one of the things they were to do was to cut down branches from trees, and they began their worship. Spreading garments out for someone to walk on was more than an act of chivalry. You know, we know, now I've never seen this in my life, but we've all seen pictures depicted where a man would lay his coat down over a puddle, right? And uh, uh, the lady would walk across. I've never seen that. And that must have been happened a long time ago. But apparently it was an act of chivalry. But that's not how it was on this day. Connected to Christ's triumphal entry, it was a show of deference and honor. A spreading out of garments before someone was an act of submission that was paid to royalty. And then after this, they cried those words, Hosanna! Hosanna! But let me ask you today, some might know, but how many know what Hosanna means? How many really know what Hosanna means? I saw one hand go up. Isn't that something we read the word and we, we, we read it over and over and over again and there's so many things we still don't understand, right? And I have to admit, I kind of forgot what it meant as well. So what does Hosanna mean? Is it like saying hallelujah? No, not really. 
Unlike hallelujah, Hosanna is a request for salvation rather than a declaration of praise. The Hebrew words yasha, which means deliver or save, and ana, which means beg or beseech, they're combined together and they create the English term hosanna, which literally means I beg you, I beg you, save us. It literally means, I beg you, please deliver us. And many, a Christians, many Christians assume Hosanna was always a Jewish word of praise to God. But in reality, in the Old Testament, it was more like an urgent cry for help that would, in context, lead the nation to a prospering time and not being destroyed. So when the people on that day of Palm Sunday, they shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna! They were actually quoting from the book of Psalms, fulfilling prophecy in, in Psalms 118, starting in verse 21. This is what it, the prophesied about, and this is what they shouted on that Palm Sunday day. They said, save us now! Hosanna, Hosanna, I pray. O oh Lord, O oh Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Verse 26, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. In one sense, it was a desperate cry, much like a drowning person would yell out for rescue. But it's even more than that. It was an oppressed people's petition for freedom. Hosanna, Lord, I beg you, save us, save us now. And see, it made perfect sense for the crowd in Jerusalem that day to shout Hosanna as Jesus rode the donkey into Jerusalem. In their address, they said, Son of David, and they referred to Jesus as their Messiah. They cried out for salvation and they acknowledged Jesus' ability to save them. And you see, as time, went, as time went on, the term Hosanna evolved from a cry for help to a shout of praise. Baker's Evangelistic Dictionary tells us originally Hosanna was an appeal for deliverance. And it came, in, it came in liturgical usage to serve as an expression of joy and praise for deliverance granted or anticipated. When Jesus came to Jerusalem for his final presentation of himself to Israel, the expression came readily from the lips of the Passover crowds, Hosanna! And what they really were saying was, Save us! Save us! Save us! And if you're here today, I want you to know, and if you need help today, and maybe you're a prisoner of sin, maybe you're a prisoner of bad habits, maybe you're the prisoner of a lying tongue, maybe you're a prisoner of a deceitful heart, maybe you're the prisoner of sinful thoughts, I want you to know that our King is here today, and you can shout Hosanna along with the thunderous crowds. I wonder right now if we could just lift our hands. Let's raise our voices. Would you reflect a little bit right now? What do you need help in? What are you struggling with right now? What, what sin has you burdened down? What, what kingdom of Satan has you? Hallelujah. You can shout right now, Hosanna! Hosanna! Save us, Lord! Save me, Lord! Save me, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And you see, Jesus came riding on a donkey in pur on purpose because he was bringing peace, not war. He was bringing life, not death. And he was bringing love, not hate. Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 19, it says this, For God in all of his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, God reconciled everything to himself. He made, what? He made peace 
with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. And this includes you who once were far away from God. <clears throat> You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and your evil actions. And yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. And as a result, he has brought you into his own presence. And you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. Think of how powerful that is. Look what it says. You're holy and you're blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. You might think, man, I got so many faults I can't even keep track of them all. And you know what? In our earthly sense, that is true. But when you enter into the relationship with Jesus Christ through the new birth, I want you to know he sees you different than you see yourself. It's the reason I can get up every morning in spite of my faults, knowing that my God, my Savior, my King, came riding on a donkey bearing peace, looking to make love, not war. Remember that term from the 50s or the 60s? Make love, not war. That's what God wants to do. He wants to make peace. And he wants to bring you in a right relationship. Paul was reminding the church here at Colossae of the powerful privilege they received when they were born again of the water and spirit. And you see, Holy Week, I hope, helps us to re remind us of those very important things. Put the foolishness out of our minds. Put the sports world and the entertainment world, get rid of all that junk just for one week. And why don't you contemplate on the great mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ? Because those things are all going to pass away. The football stars and the basketball stars are going to all grow old and die. Did you ever see a picture of Larry Bird lately? Man, is he an old guy. It's going to all pass away. It's going to mean nothing in eternity. But what will mean, what the only thing that will stand and mean was what Christ did for us. You see, we are really living in the best time. We're living in the best time. In spite of all the craziness that's going on in the world about us, in spite of all the wars and the rumors of wars, in spite of the acts of terrorism throughout the world and the uh, unsettledness in our society, we are living in the best times. You see, the people in Jesus' day, they got, they got God's timeline all mixed up. And you see, we fall prey to that too. We have to understand that God has a timeline. And he, no one's going to make him speed it up or slow it down. God is sovereign in these areas. And the people of Jesus today, they got the timeline. They got of God's plan all wrong. They thought the earthly kingdom would come first. Deliver us from the Romans, O Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna, save us from the Roman Empire. They thought that was their biggest need. They thought their biggest need was to get the political system correct. They thought the biggest need was to get the national uh, things in their nation correct. No, their biggest need was a savior for their sins. You see, your biggest need, my biggest need isn't more money. It's not a bigger house. It's not a car. If you're single, your biggest need isn't finding a spouse. It's getting in a right relationship and staying there with the Lord Jesus Christ because all the other things will disappoint, all the other things will fail, all the other things aren't going to last. Only Jesus and what we do for him will last. In fact, this idea that they needed to be delivered from the Roman Empire was so ingrained in them that even the disciples brought it up to Jesus before he ascended into heaven. 
He had now resurrected from the grave. He was now getting ready to ascend into heaven. And his disciples are still bringing up this idea, save us from the Roman Empire. And Acts chapter 1 verse 6 says this, so when the apostles were with uh, Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? And he replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and those times. They are not for you to know. They're not for you to know. Get your priorities straight. Get your timeline straight. The biggest thing you can do in your life is ask the question, am I living for God today? Am I being faithful? We sang about God's faithfulness. We, saw, we sang about how his promises stand. His faithfulness is never a question. The question is our faithfulness. Are you faithful to Christ today? And as Holy Week progresses and we take time and think about the things that he suffered and why he did that. He did that for you and he did that for me. For Because one day... God will judge sin. And when I stand before him one day, I want to have a Savior by my side. I want to have the blood of Christ applied to my life. And when he can look at me and say, well done, thou good and faithful servants. I won't even be able to say to him, what about all my faults? He's going to look and say, what faults? I don't see any faults. Because that's how he views us when we stay in right relationship with God, we're living in the best time because he's still on a donkey right now. He's still bringing peace to a world that needs peace so bad. He's still bringing the opportunity for peace to people that are suffering and in bondage and slavery to sin. Oh, there's going to be a time, God has a timeline, there's going to be a time when our king comes again and this time when he comes, it's not going to be on a donkey. He is going to come on a horse, a symbol of war. And he's coming to judge the nations that stand against him in defiant wickedness and against his people, the nation of Israel. Revelation chapter 19, speaking of a time that is going to come, it says, Now when I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and his head were like many, on, on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no one knew except himself. And he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name was called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, and with it he and with that that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God, and he has on his robe and on his thigh. Uh, a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I want you to know that today, right now, this day, this Palm Sunday, it's not too late to cry, Hosanna, Hosanna, save me, Lord. For the Bible says that now is the time, today is the day of salvation. I tell you what, once you cry, you have to believe. And then once you believe, you have to have faith. And then once you have to have faith, once you have faith, you have to have obedience. You see, many people believe. Some will even have faith. But God's looking for the whole thing. He's looking for obedience to his word. Jesus came and he did his part. Now it's time to do ours, isn't it? On the day of Pentecost, Peter preached to the very people. This is pretty interesting. 
Peter preached on the day of Pentecost after Jesus had went into heaven and on the day of Pentecost God poured out his spirit. They began to speak in other tongues as God had given them the utterance and on that day the people came out to see what all the commotion was about. And Peter preached to the very people who just shortly before were crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, save me. But they turned around very quickly. And their shouts of Hosanna turned to shouts of, Crucify him, crucify him. You wonder, my goodness, how could that happen? Well, they had the wrong idea, didn't they? They had the idea Christ Jesus came to save them from the Roman Empire. They thought he came to defeat the Romans. Not only did Jesus not do that, but the exact opposite happened. He was their prisoner. And not only was he their prisoner, he was awaiting a certain death. And so the people, maybe they became a little disillusioned. Well, I thought this one we were saying, save me, save me, was going to defeat the Romans. And now he's in their very clutches, soon to be hanging on a cross. Maybe they felt feelings of disillusion. Maybe they felt betrayed. But at some point, they looked at him and said, what good is he to us now? He's a defeated person hanging on a cross. Crucify him, crucify him. But the king, the king of the Jews, who came on a donkey, reached out to them through the preaching of Peter, and he offered them peace. The ones who were consenting to his death offered them peace. When Peter preached, he established two things from the scripture that day on the day of Pentecost. Number one, he established that Jesus really was the descendant of King David, the promised king that was going to come. And number two, he established on the day of Pentecost that this Jesus was the suffering Messiah. He was both. In Acts chapter 2 verse 29 this is Peter preaching. He says, men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, knowing that God has sworn unto him an oath, that from the fruit of his, bo fruit of his body, in other words, his descendant, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ which was Jesus to sit on his throne. He foreseeing this spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. And this Jesus was raised up, of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted on the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, which is poured out, uh, which you now see and hear. He was both a king and he was both the suffering Messiah. And you see, when they realized this, when that crowd that were one day shouting Hosanna, and now they were shouting crucify him, when they realized their terrible sin, when they realized the horrible mistake they made, when they were convicted and they realized they probably committed one of the worst acts you could ever do, they asked a question in Acts chapter 36. Peter finished up his preaching and he said, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made this Jesus whom you crucified. You made him suffer. You made him hang on the cross. He is both Lord and Christ both the king and the suffering Messiah. And now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? How are we going to fix this horrible situation? Then Peter said unto them, repent. 
And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? Well, for the remission of those sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And I want you to know today that the Lord is still calling. The Lord is still on a donkey today. He's still pouring out his spirit. He's still pouring out the Holy Ghost. And if you're here today and you need a touch from God, I want you to know that your king is here. Would you stand with me now? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Save me, Lord. Help me, Lord. I want you to know if you have that cry in your heart today, we're going to open up the altar in just a moment. And you can lift up whatever situation you're facing right now. And you can say, Hosanna, save me. And I want you to know your king who's riding on a donkey will enter the, your life. He will enter your heart. And he's going to do his part. He's going to always do his part. The question will be, are you willing to do your part? Are you willing to grow in Christ? Are you willing to be patient as he works you through those situations? Are you willing to stick with it through thick and thin? Are you willing to put up with your brother and sister who maybe at times get under your skin? Are you willing to be faithful to God and his body which is the church you see I think many times we ask God for help and he begins to work in our life but because it doesn't fit our timetable we end up short of receiving God's promises we're just many times we're just moments away from a miracle and we stop and we give up but I'm challenging you today don't give up as we come to the altar right now, I invite you to come. Bring your burden, bring your care, and you cry out to the Lord, Hosanna, Hosanna. Help me, Lord. Hallelujah. Help me, Lord, for I find myself in this situation, or I find myself in that situation. Help me, Lord. Hosanna, Lord. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah.